And I want you to know That I'm missing you more than you can imagine And they teach you how to wheel and deal and fire But no, I never show you how to give And they train you down the track of how Um, this is Richard from the Cultural Arts Collective, and this week we have the amazing Ash Grumwell coming to us, who's playing the Byron Bay Blues Festival shortly. How are you going, Ash? Good, Rich. How are you going? Not too bad, not too bad. Um, Byron Bay Blues Festival coming up. We're featuring you guys on Christine Arnoux's ABC Weekends program, and we're going around Australia talking about that wonderful festival. Tell me, what is, what's your, you've played there a few times, what's your experience of... Uh, the beautiful Blues Festival. I absolutely love, love, love Blues Fest. Um, I've been playing it for many years. It was almost always my dream to play Blues Fest. And this will be my 10th Blues Fest. Um, wow. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, I probably played, I played it the first time probably about 20 years ago. And, um, yeah, everybody wants to play Blues Fest. So I feel very lucky to have done you know, to be doing my 10th one. And um, it's really special. And the, the the lineup of internationals is insane. And um, so many legends, you know, at the level of Bob Dylan, B.B. King, wow, you know, yeah. Angelique Kidjo, I don't know, so many. I used to love watching the Blind Boys of Alabama. Um, wow. Ben Harper's played it many years. Buddy. That's what I know. Did you meet Ben Harper? No, I haven't met Ben oh Harper. Oh, my God. What do you mean? Yeah, that's a... You know, he he really, in my mind, I could be wrong about this, but I kind of credit him in a way with sparking the blues and roots kind of vibe in Australia. I, I remember him coming to Melbourne in the nineties, in the yeah. in the late nineties, and then, you know, by the time the noughties rolled around, you had sort of John Butler coming out the blocks and stuff like that, and I, and Xavier Rudd and uh, the Waifs. And, uh, you know, and I was sort of, yeah, I was in that kind of scene. And uh, when that thing came along, it was awesome. (laughs) (laughs) It was was so good for me because I was already a blues player and I I didn't really have, it was my dream and I was already living that dream by the year 2000, I would say, to be a professional musician. Um, But that, that, that didn't have any kind of, uh, level attached to it, like I didn't think I was going to be known widely or have any level of fame. Or it, it wasn't what I was going for. It, it wouldn't have been realistic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I never, in the, my wildest dreams, thought I would ever have a song on Triple J. That's and then just the the way the world worked out and that roots thing coming along, it was like I. Would, supported for a um, great many years on Triple J and I actually ended up being a host on Triple J. Um, so, you know, th- things worked out a hell of a lot better than I ever could have dreamed. Yeah. How did you get your start in the blues? Like, where did that come from? Um, like, you're, well, a young, it, you're a young guy. Why weren't you playing rap, metal, you know, blues? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like... I think, you know, like, say if I was on my year nine or ten camp, School camp, I remember them, you know, hearing Red Hot Chili Peppers, Pearl Jam, Nirvana, U2, you know, that kind of thing, yeah, Rage yeah. Against the Machine. Some of those things seeped into my music a little bit, but I just loved blues. I, I, I really did. Um, I was very influenced by that movie that even at the time I thought it was cheesy, but I still thought it was awesome, um, called Crossroads which starred yeah. wow. Ralph Macchio, the karate kid. That's right. As, and I always laugh because it's like the same narrative as the karate kid. It's just <laughs> taken right. to blues music. So he, you know, he meets the wise man, but instead of Mr. Miyake, it's Willie Brown, an old blues guy. Well, that, and, that's, the, uh, that's the criticism of blues music, isn't it? It's the same story all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they just do the hero's journey. 
Yeah, uh, that's you it. know, if you're into, I, I ended up studying script writing and and stuff like that at uni, and um, mm. I remember about the hero's journey, and uh, you know that was the hero's journey. Um, that that movie, yeah, yeah. That was awesome. But yeah, that really influenced me, and um, and I think culturally, uh, you know, because you know, my family, one side of my family's brown, the other fi- side's white, and I grew up in a really Anglo area. And uh, there's something uh, like one side of my family's um, coloured South African, which is kind of they were the meat in the sandwich in Cape Town between white and African. So they still didn't have the rights. They still had that Rosa Parks bus kind of situation with restaurants and everything like that. Um but they didn't live in the same townships and absolute poverty that the actual African people lived in. They were the middle of the road. So they got segregated. Um, but they were they, segregated. But they didn't have, they had like a, a bit more privilege than the Africans or? Yes, yeah. Because that's where um, the, like the South Asians and fit into that sort of coloured, don't they? Like yeah, and Indians and people with, but also people with African blood. Mixed um, blood sort of thing. Yeah, mixed too. It's just the mixed race people. Right, right. But right. almost because of the apartheid system got pushed together into a race. So yes. it's this real Creole culture. And um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really cool. They're, you know, known as like kind of just fun loving kind of people, sort of, I don't know how you describe it, jive talking kind of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, they sort of, I don't know, a lot of those, the South Africans that I did meet, which wasn't a lot in my childhood, were, they remind me of black American people, yeah, the way I... they express themselves. So that there was something in that kind of music and that kind of black American culture that really appealed to me. And yeah. I think that's one reason why I really got into blues music. That's interesting what you're touching about because, I did I do a lot of work or did a lot of work in Western Sydney, which is really culturally diverse, and seeing the South Sudanese people come in over the last, you know, 10 or 15 years mm. and young people really identifying with the American hip-hop thing. Yeah. Right, about that yeah. thing about seeing yourself in another culture mm. and, you know, it's popular, it's just, it's amazing. And mm. so I wonder if, you know, the generation before you had a similar thing for African-American music or coming out of South Africa Mm. Like I mean, even then there was the already the hip hop thing um, yeah. in Australia. I was a little weirdo being into blues, I think. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, you get yeah, a couple yeah. of them, and you know, yeah. like some kids really like that to be into something different. I don't know why. You don't have a choice sometimes when some music grabs you. You know, uh, it just seemed like okay, you've got soul music, you've got R and B, you've got all these things, but like it all comes back down to. It comes back to blues as as the heart of it, um, and kind of a big part of where it came from. And I, I think I have a tendency to kind of like try to go to the heart of things, yeah. Like um, or or back to the roots of things for one of for one of a less a uh, bit of a cliche term <laughs> in, in in the context of this conversation. Yeah, but yeah. I like getting to the roots and seeing where things came from. Um. Yeah. It's just maybe nerding out or or just well, liking the fundamentals of things. Were you a, a grounded kid when you were growing up? Do you think like I always see the blues, you know, African music, this and the people that play are very grounded humans. You know what I mean? Like very grounded and hence creative, working with these different communities. Were you a grounded kid? Do you think or? Yeah, yeah, I definitely. Um, I mean, I, my mum tells me that I sort of came out of the womb kind of with the personality that I probably currently have. Um, you were sent down, man. You were sent down. Yeah. <laughs> the blues yeah. messiah. <laughs> yeah. So it suited me to like sing like an old man. Cause like I, I sort of had a little bit, maybe a little bit of an old soul. Um, yeah. Wow. Well. Yeah. But. And what yeah. about your, what about your dad? Did he, what music was he listening to in around the house? Well, he, he did that, you know, like, so they came out in the White Australia policy mm. when the White Australia policy was in effect. And that's what it was called in, like, 72. Yeah, still um, then. And, yeah, wow. And, um, and uh, the idea was split the migrants up. So 
um, uh, they were sort of surrounded. We grew grew up, and my dad, well, because my dad was thirteen when he came out, yeah, um, wow. but um, and so they we lived in a really Anglo kind of area where most of the immigration was English, wow. um, but they really. Um, there's sort of a lot of good in it too because, like, I mean, my dad always brought me up to be proud of that side of my culture, but he really embraced Australia. And it was five brothers and they all married um, to sort of kind of dinky-dye Aussie. Anglo-Aussies. Yeah. Anglo-Aussies. And, mm. and really, really stayed really proud and really out there kind of people. Um, and, um, but also just really embraced the Australian culture. And, and so my dad listened to like some Australiana and, wow. <laughs> and country, and, That's brave. And country music. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, it influenced me too, because like, I listened to guys like John Williamson, um, who really told really, they're pretty dinky die Aussie stories, but he told them from a, uh, a number of perspectives and he was all about writing songs that related to people and their experiences. And uh, Red Gum, who were very yeah. much, you know, you know, I learned about the horrors of war from listening to that song Only 19 and mm. also maybe developed a little bit of a um, scepticism of the government from them. And a wanderlust to go out and see the country, you know. Yeah, And yeah, those yeah. were really good things. And, you know, even though I ended up getting into the genre of blues, the songwriting element probably came from listening to that stuff and realising what you can convey in a song, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And, and that, I suppose, you talked about studying script writing. It's all about the narrative, right? It's all about the stories in whatever mm. form you're interested in at the moment, be it the blues or writing or whatnot so there's that strong theme for you in your life as an artist is that right or yeah storytelling and i yeah, do yeah. Think that you know like a lot of people you know i have 11 studio albums now um and a lot of the songs that people request it's it's often because it's a story yeah um, so you know the storytelling thing is is really cool and it's funny as as the years have gone on and I've experimented with different genre subgenres, or, or like presenting my music in in uh, in different ways. Um, the more commercial I make it, or the more poppy it is, or whatever. Sometimes it has less of a story. So, mm. um, but when I do a song that sounds like an ancient blues song, there's a bit more of a story to it sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what um, I suppose people have got to know you about. Hey, let's. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that whole storytelling thing. And it can't be easy telling that massive story and doing it solo most of the time. Like a lot of the time you're just, you and your, your, <laughs> you're like one of those Simpsons cartoons with the, the kick drum going and there's bagpipes and the, and the guitars. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've had different setups of my one man band thing yeah. sometimes. And sometimes it gets so complicated that I start to feel, yeah, this is, this is too, this is too buskery. This is too gimmicky, and then I'll end up going in a different, uh, yeah, in a, in a different direction. Um, yeah, but it's fun. It keeps it keeps me interested. Um, I'm always mucking around with sounds and try and make it. Uh, it's nice if you do the one man band kind of thing because, or one person band, because you can you get that huge dynamic. But there's nothing stopping you from just doing a simple. Yep. Pokey style song as well, so you Probably get a right really there. wide yeah. dynamic. Whereas if you've got a drummer on the stage who's just itching to play, <laughs> uh, you can't <laughs> talk to the audience or anything. They're like, "Come on, come on, come on, speed it up, let's go!" <laughs> you know? I get paid by the beat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so, where are you at now on that journey in regards to performing? You're doing these? What are you doing at the uh, Blues Fest? Are you going solo, a duo? Or uh, no, I'm doing a three-piece band at, at Blues Fest just for Blues Fest, but normally yeah. it is um, it is actually a solo show for the last couple of years. Um, yeah, but um, I'm playing with uh, my good friend um, Bobby Arlu on drums, who's an amazing performer in his own right, and um, Ian Perez, who's a, just a fantastic uh keyboard, bass, everything else kind of play. He played in Wolf Mother for years, oh, played yeah. with Xavier Wright, he's playing with. 
the Whitlam's and Bernard Fanning, and they both play in Busby Maru, and they just play yeah, with right. everyone. Wow. But um, yeah, so it's a really great power trio. That's fantastic. And why why the trio for the Blues Fest? You thought bigger stage, more people, or something different, or um, Blues Fest requested it actually. Yeah, right. they wanted me to do what the thing that I did last year. I've done all different things. I yeah, you know, I really made my name at Blues Fest doing the solo thing. Right. But I've done like um. 10 piece 11 piece bands and just all sorts of you know Perfect for a little while there i thought and i might do it again you know it's awesome to have that kind of cat empire kind of feel where you're just feeling you know this stuff going on everywhere you know and people are partying you know that's good too is it amazing um, but, having a horn section or something playing oh that? yeah it doesn't oh, take the pressure that. off for you <laughs> I don't know if it takes. Uh, it's it's an honor to stand in the middle of it. That's pretty. That's a pretty cool thing when it's all yeah. going crazy. Like I had five horns, two backing singers, since since bass and bass, and and one guy in the horn section had the giant sousaphone. Yeah, um, wow, fantastic. Yeah, the sousaphone. People picture a tuba, but bigger, um, and yeah. a bass saxophone. Not not a baritone sax, but a bass saxophone. It was just gigantic. That was fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I think it's solo is a bit of a scam, actually, because um, there's something about it that makes it easy to hold an audience because yeah, they're more the focused on you. Yeah, become, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they focus in on you. Mm. You don't jump around the stage. So it, it all happens in one area. And although you would think that you need more bells and whistles, sometimes... And if it's on a giant PA to a giant audience or something, then people think, wow, he made all that noise from one guy, but it's just going through the PA. You know, wow. <laughs> you know when, so, I've, when I've played with the horn section, I'll go, wow, I don't have to do anything. I can just lock yeah. power chords, you know. Like there's so yeah, much yeah. amazing support around. So I just thought, you know, you're doing the solo thing and then having that support around you must have been a bit of a, mm. a bit more of a relief, but uh, no, I see what you mean. Um, yeah, you you do have this support. It's like they're cradling you, like they lift you up, mm. and like a really good drummer is like that. Yes. Like especially if you do upbeat music, they almost just like they put you, they 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 almost produce you musically in yeah, the yeah, moment. Absolutely. They they place your music in a context. Yeah. And uh, the the good ones, you know, they just put you just in this beautiful spot that you you feel so lucky to. I can't believe I've been presented like this. This is awesome, <laughs> as you say, the elevator effect. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's pretty ready, awesome when when, awesome. It, when that's all you know, and it's you know, and it's something beautiful about it just being a collaborative thing with multiple yeah. people. That's the best thing about a band. Tell me, speaking of that, we talked previously about um, Blues Fest last year coming out of COVID. Was that last year when you talked about that? Yeah, um, that was, was just absolutely magic. So we're talking about COVID was such amazing, well, not amazing is not a good word, it was, it was hard for everyone, like for the muses I worked with who were hustling day in, day out. You were saying, you're saying that, you know, was a, you know, COVID had a really, you know, detrimental effect for all musicians, including you, is that right? Massive, massive. Yeah, it was really hard to deal with. Um, you know, I was touring Europe um, at the time that it it happened, and you know, it's so long ago now. And you know, for me personally, I know some other people are back over in Europe, but I mean, that stuff kind of fell away, and it's sort of like something that I'll have to start again on. You know. Um, Build those bridges again, you mean, or that momentum? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, you know, like um, a music career relies on momentum and, you know, when you've been doing it for a long time, building that momentum is is quite a thing. Yes. And uh, I had a life change probably about five or six years ago where I really started to, I dared to try and manifest something bigger for my career and it was a really intentional thing. Um. You know, I, that was around the time I, I also quit drinking and I wrote a book and I did all sorts of things um, and I really rebuilt and I saw some things come true for me and come to fruition that I I, I wouldn't have dared to dream of, but I, I, I just uh, took a leap of faith and actually um, 
was my wife actually who who um really helped me in that to like dare to dream for something audacious and some of that stuff did happen um the main stuff that i tried to manifest did happen which was awesome um and i could talk about that later but like um one of those things was getting a getting a good career, a full career happening in Europe with a view to maybe moving over there. And that was happening. Um, and it was really cool to have something happen that I'm, I meant to happen. I set out yeah, to yeah, make yeah. it happen. A lot of self-belief comes out of that, that sort of stuff, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, and it only came from self-belief. And mm. that was the big thing that turned around. Yeah. And it was an experience in my life of doing it on purpose <laughs> yeah, and yeah. um so that was cool um but there was there wasn't much i could do about it being struck down um yeah by, by the recent the, by the event so that kind of hit hard and then um you know just what you know i just got a mortgage and a family and you know all those things and um i, I rely on gigging so you know there's a lot that i i am prepared to work so hard um but it, you know and and i'm not worried i'm never worried never have been worried about um earning a living from playing music and if i have to dig holes i dig holes too but um you know when when it's illegal for you to do it then there's nothing much you can do about that so yeah, it was a, yeah. it was an experience of me surrendering to um forces outside myself yeah, because you're you're you writing this self-created tsunami or self-belief, and then yeah. it becomes and crashes it all. Is that what happened? That must have been hard. Yeah. yeah, that was hard because I couldn't really, you know, yeah, self-belief my way out of it or or have any attitude adjustments. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. it was one of those um, you know, sweat the things that you can change kind of, I forget what the saying is, but you spiritual know, lesson, no, spiritual lesson number 27, surrender, yeah. surrender yeah, to yeah. the God. Yeah, well, A- absolutely. You know, it was, was one of surrender. Um, so yeah, a lot of that focus had to change and, um, yeah, that, that was a, that was a challenging time, but, you know, it feels so great. Um, coming out of that and one of the things um that happened sort of after the first lockdowns and everything uh i think uh, i'll forget the chronology a little bit but um i was able to i had had this <clears throat> manifestation which was a bit of a metaphor really it was like my wife said to me imagine selling out the forum which is a venue in melbourne that's um yeah really big and um, at the time, we were living in Bali, and um, I hadn't I hadn't been pulling many people to shows, and I pulled back from even putting my own thing on the line. I was just doing festivals, yeah. and it was probably the lowest point of my career. Um, this is probably about 2014, 15, maybe, and um, uh, and uh, yeah. So my wife was like, "Now, just imagine yourself selling out the forum," and I. I just thought this is BS, you know. This <laughs> it's is, never going to happen. <laughs> this is the secret, you know, like the secret. Uh, Where's the book? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's and, and, and we ended up, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and because I ended up actually believing in some of that stuff, but it, it had to be in a different way because I can't BS myself, you know. Yes. And um, so. Uh, she said, you know, imagine, you know, imagine selling out the forum. I'm like, I just can't. And she said, well, try and think of it in a way that you can imagine it. And I was like, okay, well, I guess at my age as a blues player, if I became a um, bit more of a guitar shredder, you know, like, you know, stand there in front of a band shredding away on the guitar, it would A, be super fun because <laughs> <laughs> I never had let myself do that because I, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of was in the mindset that that was an indulgent thing and nobody wants that anymore. We've had that for years. It's time for something new. And I thought, no, now's maybe the time. I'm older. This is how I'll come back and come as a different thing, you know. Like, And um, so anyway, I said, okay, yeah, I think I can imagine and I can imagine a plan and I'm going to work really hard. I'm becoming a shredder, you know, way better guitarist. And um, it's funny because at the time, at, at that time that I made that decision, 
like say five minutes later or to me it's like straight away that I remember it but yeah yeah pretty much straight away my phone went ding and it was my agent and he said have you ever heard of Kenny Wayne Shepherd yeah wow. and I was like yeah he's a guitar shredder from America you know plays like a he was like a more recent Stevie Ray Vaughan, mm-hmm. which is what I'd just been thinking about, that shredder thing. And he goes, well, do you want to do those supports? So I got those supports wow. straight away. And I was like, wow, that's a funny coincidence. And, you know, I, I'd be, be loath to start going too far down the magical realm, but it was just an awesome coincidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then from then, you know, to cut a long story short, um, I did support Kenny Wayne at the forum that time. And then fast forward to, you know, I guess the middle of the COVID years, maybe it was 2021, I I actually played the forum, a sold-out forum, with wow. Josh Teske in the duo that we had. Wow. So, um, you know, it came in a strange way, but actually that audacious thing that I tried to manifest did come in the end. So it was amazing. Yeah, yeah it's so interesting. It's so interesting, isn't it? Like it speaks to me about having a vision, not a mystical vision, but a vision, right? Yeah, you know, you, know, you want to get it from point A to point B. How are you going to get there in your way? You know, yeah. you know, even in a practical, and you're a grounded guy, so that works for you. <laughs> if you're just yeah, having it, like too, fu- you're too weird and airy fairy yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah. But like, if you, what one thing that worked for me and that convinced me to go for it was for that kind of line is don't wait for something to be possible. Don't before you can can dare to ask it of the universe or ask it of whatever of life to deliver it. Like don't set only the goals that you can easily foresee happening. Cause that's yes. what we normally do. We go, okay, yeah, well, I can see that happening. Maybe I could do this so that then I'll think that it's possible, but just like yeah. maybe go for something just a little beyond what you think is possible and wait for yeah, yeah. you, you tell, like, let's just say for argument's sake, you tell the universe what you're after. And you just relax and work. Yeah. Do the work. Do all the work necessary to do it and let your subconscious figure out a way to make it happen and, and just be alert and ready for the opportunities when they come. And and that's what I did do. And I even saw that happen in Europe too where I had this attitude. I got I was sort of on fire after a while. And also um, doing my book where I interviewed these um, top surfers who were musicians and musical surfers. Surf and, by day, jam by night? Yeah, and I, I interviewed um, Kelly Slater and Steph Gilmore and Steph was telling me who has she's the greatest female surfer of all time. Mm. Uh, she's um, won now seven world, no, eight world titles now. Wow. Um, and she was telling me about that manifestation thing and saying she uses it. And she said, wow. Kelly uses it too. And I was like, wow, okay, well, these people have the score on the board. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go with him. <laughs> yeah. And if you think about it, I bet you Olympians and I bet you Hollywood people and lots of really successful business people, I bet you they all use something like that. And um, I wrote about this in my book. I was like, I'm sick of like only believing in the things that I could convince somebody at a barbecue that it's true. You know, like I'd rather go for something that actually I need something that works. I'm not going to worry so much about the details of, well, technically, you know, this is, you know, uh, you know, being so sceptical of everything. Um, And all I can say is in my brief little experiment that I tried, it did work for me. So, um, well, you know, what brings to my, for me is, we talked about you being a grounded person from day one, possibly as your mum might have said, and and the other side is the ego, right? So most of the time, a lot of people are going, the ego, I want to do this, I want to be whoever, I want to achieve this goal because it's amazing using your ego, but you sound like you're coming up from it from completely the different way where you had to in, put your ego into it instead of always keeping it out of it. You know, like you talked about it just, in 2014, you were just like, yeah, whatever. Um, yeah, but, you're right. Do you know what I mean? Like I remember talking to guys, some heavy-duty dudes that meditate, and they said, and they talk about losing ego, but they also say you still need it to get even in the spiritual realm to raise your aspirations that bit to allow yes. your being to join it. 
Yeah, and it's fun to aspire, you know, mm. and it's fun to have success. You know, that's the thing. It's okay to, it, I, I think, you know, that Aussie tall poppy syndrome thing can get us, which are, you know, Australian artists overseas and stuff. People really like working with us because we're really grounded and we're not, yeah. we're not, we don't get too carried away with ourselves. Um, but the flip side of that is that sometimes you're like, talking it down too much mm. and you, because every time you say something your subconscious is listening and thinks oh okay it's just you know people give you a compliment you're like yeah 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 and then you say all the bad things and then your subconscious is listening to that yeah it, yeah and um, it's sort of dangerous so I I yeah did some work on on turning that around and it was very very helpful and very fun um, and it, it, it gets it gets a bit of a vibe going inside you when you I was journaling a lot too which really mm -hmm. helps like just to write every day about it and if you get this vibe going within yourself I think people around you pick that up and then things start to fall in place for you start to magnetize so, or something yeah 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 it's it's really cool I, I I you know the other thing I think on an airy fairy level or, or whatever you want to call <laughs> a woo woo <laughs> level of that stuff is I'm not so 100% sure we know everything that's going like scientifically Science hasn't finished, you know, where if you think the human race is going to hopefully continue on for a long time and we might find further down the track some things that we will, we will inevitably find some things that we don't currently understand. So, you know, I don't know. May, I'm just I'm more saying who's to say the exact mechanics of how some mental things work, but if they work or if people that you respect have used them, you know, why not use them? Absolutely, absolutely. Because, you know, you've got a family as well, right? You've got, you've got children? Yeah. You must. Yeah, how, how old are they? Uh, 14 and 10. Well, you must have seen it in them as well, hey? Like, you know, what they talk and how what you say to them, how it affects them, what they say to themselves. You know, I noticed when I had children, you get to notice, like, you're talking about self-talk and, and what, what you put out, you go, just whatever it comes out of it has an effect on that child, be it yeah, positive, positive, positive or negative, right? So as you say, maybe, it's, maybe it goes the other way as well as what you were talking about. Yeah, because you don't know, like, say, like, you know, we're in a, we're these days out, and I'm a classic for this, we get very cerebral and it's all about our thoughts and, and um you know, I don't know what part of the brain that is. That, but uh, is it the prefrontal cortex? I don't know. But uh, <laughs> think, 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 clever, clever, clever. Think, 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 think. Yeah. And we're sort of blind to maybe some other things that uh, other abilities that we have that are from ancient times that we might have used more. But they're probably still going on. So I guess what I'm saying is, when somebody's in your presence, they they'll pick up subtle cues and, and subtle things from your being that what you're thinking, and, and in a way, it probably does generate a little bit of a, how you feel internally yes. is, um, is transferred to the people around you. You know what it's like, you know, when yeah. somebody's just got a fantastic vibe yeah. or then somebody else has got a very dark vibe. It almost like you get, if you spend time, you can always just stand next to them and, you start to assimilate, like you, you, you can almost feel a little bit of what's going on. They can either drag you down or they can make you feel great. Yeah. So, like, it, I think it's important, even though we don't 100% understand all the mechanisms, to be sort of programming yourself in the positive ways, in, in the ways that uh, help you to achieve the things you want to achieve in the world, but also just to be the person you want to be in the world. Yeah, yeah. It's so, you know, the idea of transformation came to me when you're talking, you know, you know, your music transforms people, right? That's why they come and see you. Like yes. I, I remember going to a, a gospel singing workshop. There's 100 people singing four-part harmony with Tony, amazing Tony Backhouse. And at the end, I wanted to become a Christian, you know, because I was like, praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> because yeah. the, the, the harmonies, the singing, the, and that's yeah. what music does, right? And yeah, 
And when you're around people, as you say, I, I know this couple in London, I go and see them. I feel like I'm the best person I can be around these people because they're just so loving and supportive. And I feel like, you know, I feel so transformed around them. It's Yeah. You forget about that. I forget about that anyway. Yeah, well, I forget too until I'm yeah, having yeah. this conversation with you. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> right, I'm going to journal when I get off this call. Because um, it's so important. You know, sometimes the best habits, like, like those habits I'm telling you about, like that got me into some insane places like in my life, like great, you know, like the European thing was fully happening. Um, the thing with Josh Teske was absolutely fantastic. Like I said, I wrote that book. Yeah. Um, things like that. It's just like I was really on fire and it, and it is funny uh, to be full disclosure. That darkness that came in, around the COVID time and thinking about things, giving a lot of power and thinking about things that were external, I stopped generating from within. Because, like, everything we just described, it was probably my first time in my whole life that it had been, that I'd been, I consciously did it on purpose and it came from a mental thing. And I saw it happen in the real world, and that was amazing. Because mm. you naturally do that when you're young, but you're young, you're just going for it, you know. <laughs> so you're not thinking about it. You don't know anything. You're just pinching yourself, and everything's cool. But to, <clears throat> to do it in the middle yes, of your life, yes, like yes. once you've had a long career in something, it's effort. You've got to actually do it on purpose. Wow. Wow. Um, so it's, a, yeah, it's almost like you're, um, you know, like you've given up alcohol or you're becoming, you know, something like that, and then. My life's going amazing, and bang, you start drinking again or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, like a yeah, relapse. Yeah. I you started had a, mentally. You had, mentally you had, yeah. yeah. You had a, I had a mental relapse. Manifestation yeah. relapse or something. Yeah. Yeah, that's really well put. Um, <laughs> and I'm only just, yeah, it's really like now we've all come out of, you know, those weird times and, like, it's like, yeah, I've been slower out of the blocks in some ways than some others. But, um I mean, on a gig front, I wasn't, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got on the front foot with all of that and, um, you know, that was really good. But, um, yeah, to, to hit that fully, like, uh, meow, you know, really be zinging, <laughs> it, it's taken a while, you know. Because, you know, that's the other thing that's so, not so sexy for everybody to hear is it, that whole thing, cultivating that kind of thing. It's like it takes some work. You know, you've got to... Like it's like daily. I, I think journaling is a great thing for that. You've 100%. got to be writing out some stuff every day and and get in this methodical habit, just like say going to a gym or something. You've got to do that mentally to really 100%. 100%. get on that really on that really good level. I was talking. Um, I was lucky enough to um, have an Indian artist visit me from Chennai and hang out with me for two weeks as part of a placement. He's an up. Um, you know, I was council leaders program, but he works with the castless society in Chennai, creating music with these castless people, you know, who are, have no, you know, no relevance in their culture, but they're playing temples and so on and so forth. And so, but he composes music by day and works with these people by, by night almost. And he was exhausted. He'd come over to me and he goes, well, you know, how do you, how do you keep going? And I, going on what you were saying is about I said to him you have to put something back into yourself every day mm. whatever that is you talked about journal you talked about exercise mm. for my for me it's meditation and stuff like that oh cool and you know be it you know exercise that's focused to mindfulness as well but the bottom whatever it is everyone's got their own thing or needs to have an own thing I reckon it's about putting something back in because as humans we just outpouring day in day out you know mm. by talking by listening by listening to the news by playing music and then how do you how do you find that energy you have to put something back in is kind of you're my so thing. right about that yeah. that's so wise yeah it's mm. very very true mm. um yeah when i was on fire too there's another thing and i have let this one slip a little bit too <laughs> i was into the wim hof breathing yeah right i haven't heard of that you know wim hof no i don't Oh, oh, anyone who's listening to this, you know, you could just go down the YouTube rabbit hole. He is classic. He's this Dutch guy and he's he's hilarious. He's kind of like crazy in a good way. 
Um, but um, and this is, I have no no doubt. Like I can easily say this. And when I first probably started saying it, it wasn't so accepted. But he is a hundred percent validated in science. He's scientifically validated. He's been hooked up to all of the the tests and done so many amazing things. But he basically. He's the big guy. They call him the Ice Man. He's big on the cold exposure. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. Wow. But but what I re- I hate the cold. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and I do, I, I do do I do do the cold stuff. Um, but uh, not as much as I was doing it. But um, the breathing exercises, which you can get his bre- Wim Hof breathing exercises on YouTube. Oh my God, they give you so much energy and wow. meditation wise, they take you to such a deep place. Wow. Um, It's basically you just do very intense breathing, like say basically like uh, breathing like this sort of. For about 30 or 40 breaths and then you breathe all your air out and you do an so with with no breath, like you breathe all your air out and you hold for about two minutes. Serious? Yeah, and you can do it. And then you repeat that three times or four, and um, oh my God, you go to whew, wow! You can go go to some very very deep states. So if you're a keen mm. meditator, yeah, 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 you should well, give it a go. It's check so it awesome. out, check it out. And he hey, sounds like can you I go- show you another thing too. Please do. Can Please I leave do. the screen and come back? Yeah, I'll start dancing. Go. <laughs> I got a cool device. Speaking of meditation, I was using this on my last tour. It's like the Wim Hof, Wim Hof device, is it? No, this is uh, like electrical kind of, I don't know what it is, sensors yeah. or something. Yeah. But you put this device on called, it's called Muse. Yeah. Like that, and you put it on there, and then you connect on your phone, and it reads your brain waves. Serious. And... So a lot of meditators, you might be disgusted in this at first because it's like <laughs> sounds like the opposite of meditation. Yeah, yeah. But um, you you get this app and it can read when you're in Delta, when you're in Theta, yeah, yeah, when yeah, you're, yeah. Um, and uh, the Muse app is not the one that reads your Delta or your Theta. Um, but the Muse app, you can have like um, you'll be meditating and then you can hear like. There's different settings. One is as you get into the, uh, you slow your brain waves and you get into the right thing. Birds in your earbuds, birds come closer to you. Wow! And, and then there's another one. If your your thoughts get really really busy, like you start getting thunderstorms. <laughs> you need you need a bell, a gong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's pretty yeah, amazing. That's amazing. Like, you use a bit of it's like meditation technology. Hundred percent. So I've been doing that yeah, a bit. Yeah. Well, I remember they did experiments with uh, you know master meditators, with monks and stuff, and they did that. And you know they realised that when they're in a state of meditation, their brain waves are really slow, and and so on. Which always goes back to me and you being a grounded dude since birth. That's where creativity, I reckon, comes from because your waves, you can't, nothing go, gets through when your brain's going like this, right? But when you're chilled, when you go for a surf. You know what I mean, or do something like that, or meditate. I think there's a there's more of a chance to connect of inspiration. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I've had to learn over the last ten to fifteen years. Probably, I've been learning this that because, like, when I went to uni and different things, uh, I like you know, you know, going back, I was brought up. You know, my dad's a migrant. My mum. They had me really young, and so they had to leave school, wow. high school. Wow. And um, so they put a real value on education for us and wow. said, right, you've got to, and saved up and sent us to a private school, which was wow. absolutely amazing because we didn't have a lot of money, which I really thank them for. And it's not about whether that school was good or better than the state school or whatever. It's just more that they thought it was that important that they spent their last dime Honest sacrifice, man. Oh, yeah, sacrifice. So I grew up with a real importance on, you know, um, education. And so I really probably got to a point where I thought you can think your way out of anything and I valued my intellect and mm. I worked on my intellect. 
And even my granddad, who was a builder, who the, the one who taught me music, who came from South Africa, he kept self-educating his whole life, which was amazing. What a gift. And, uh, that's yeah. A gift, that's and, a gift to the whole family, my God. Yeah, and it did affect me. And I he was he was philosophical to the end of his life. And I thought that was so amazing as it also as a tradie, you know, to be like that. So um, you're the, your life was like the crossroads movie you talked about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You had yeah, the you had friend. the elder. Yeah, my granddad looked like a blues man. That's awesome. <laughs> and he just, and he played guitar and everything. He just he didn't play blues as such. But mm. anyway, anyway, so I was really valued the intellect very highly, mm. and not and also I didn't value snobbery, just the intellect, and it can come from anywhere, you know. Um, but then it's uh, it's been later in life that I've learned from you know Eckhart Tolle and um, many others that you know the intellect can only um, get you so far or it's an instrument um, that's used for a specific purpose, but it's only one part of yes. the human. And I actually now believe that um, the intellect without wisdom is very, very dangerous and actually can be on the, even even on a um even in the logical world, if it's just intellect without any wisdom in there and, and and any compassion, it can actually be still end up being the reverse and you can end up not doing smart things and you can end up... Actually, I think you can end up crazy if, if it's intellect only. Um, yeah. So learning to slow that mind down and, and realise... And I, I'm sure you've experienced this through med meditation. What it teaches you is you start to realize when your mind's working and and you start to realize what your mind's thinking. Um, because, I mean, I think Eckhart probably said it the best when he was sort of saying the mind is a brilliant tool, but usually we don't use the tool. The tool uses us. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So well, I think yeah, yeah, meditation amazing. gives you that space to 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 work out, okay, uh, oh, okay. There, there, my mind goes. There, I go thinking that same thought again. That's interesting. Mm. Well, how how do you feel after you, you're a surfer? How do you feel after a surf? Where does your mind, where does your brain fit in there, or your thoughts? In well, it still does depend. Yeah. It still does depend. I mean, I can wreck a surf too. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know. It's With my incessant <laughs> thoughts, you know, and incessant thinking, if I let it go, I can ruin the whole surf. I can be out in nature in beauty, and I'm somewhere else thinking about I, I there's no there's no limit to what my mind can rack um it, 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 there, there's it, wisdom it, for you there yeah you know, well knowing that right that's what you're yeah, talking my, about my mind can take anything for granted mm. um and uh and it can make it can make the most of any bad situation too um but yeah, I really do love surfing it, it, it's it's very very it's a very beautiful beautiful thing um and uh it, it does so many different things for me it's so great as a musician too because it really gets you very fit gives you an over a, a, a um a workout across your whole body physically mm -hmm. um and um it connects you with nature you know i'm out there with dolphins you know most days and uh, you know everything else that's around there also, when you're underwater, you're in a different world as well. And um, there's just so many. You're out in sunlight getting vitamin D, good for COVID. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, it. you know, there's just so much that's great about it. And What's and it? also, I don't think about it very often, but the social element where you, you're bumping into people and you just, you're always having these very positive, like the way to talk in the ocean is usually very in my world anyway, I like to make it very positive and everybody else seems like that too. It's People don't like to drag their BS too much into the ocean generally. Some, but in my area, they don't do that. So it's usually do you, really Do you mean nice. as in your area, as in where you live in Byron Bay, they're a bit more chilled about that? So I thought there's a lot of politics in surfing. Right? You took my wave, dude. Yeah, there is that. <laughs> where I live is 20 minutes north of Byron, to be more specific. So mm. it's actually more like uh, sometimes we're, we're living the 70s dream here. <laughs> 70s and, surfers. That's yeah, like we, we sort of, yeah. we, you know, it's a lot, lot of neighbours and, and um, 
you know, chatting to each other, always waving when the car goes by and um, saying good always, morning. always say good morning and uh, always polite in the surf and give waves to each other and, you know, it's that kind of vibe. Wow. Um, I, I, I really detest when people go into the ocean to be grumpy. Yeah, um, yeah. I try not to do that. And I notice in myself that when, because sometimes I surf really crowded waves. When it's really good, I'll go surf a crowded wave. The, mm. the point here are amazing. And I've noticed in myself when I go internal and I go quiet and I start thinking snaky thoughts about people around me, and how I'm going to get a wave off them because they got the last one and and that they keep getting more than their fair share. And, you know, because you could be, people can be conniving in, in the ocean because only usually, you know, it's only one person can get the wave and there's not enough to go around. Um, when I do that, I do worse. I don't surf well. I don't get good waves. But when I'm open and friendly and sort of loud and bubbly in the ocean and, and looking for the good in people around me, I don't go internal and turn to the dark side. <laughs> and I get more waves that way. So it's really interesting. It reminds you of me, me looking for car parks. You know, <laughs> <laughs> everyone says, you know, take the first go, dude, I'm going for platinum. I'm going for gold. And the universe <laughs> is going to give me the best. Car. And a lot of times it happens, right? <laughs> I've heard that theory. <laughs> the car park theory. The but car- I'm like, what happens if what happens if you don't get it? Yeah. Anyway. Well, you have to ask yourself that in the surf. What happens if you're feeling the love and you don't get it? You go, you've got to re, you got to recommit <laughs> to the love. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. You're right. You know. Um, yeah, I mean, and and that gets back to one thing I said before, and that is one thing I decided in my book. There's 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 what can be empirically proven and and this and that, but there's also what works in your life. We, you know, you, you only get one life and that's what I've learned later in life. And I used to think the opposite to this, but for, for, for how to live your life, um, you should really experiment with what works best for you and, and look, you know, and it, it's an ongoing thing. You should look into um, what, what are the ways, what are the options? What are the ways to live? You know, what can we learn from ancient cultures and what can we learn from, you know, modern things about and where do ancient cultures and modern techniques converge, you know? Um, So it should be a hobby, I think, how and an obsession, how to live your life best that creates the most happiness for you and the people around you, Um, you know, but rather than, Richard Dawkins or Neil deGrasse Tyson, this is true, that guy's wrong, you know. That, yeah, yeah. That's what I used to be into. But I that made me less happy than it does to to go for yes. what are the techniques that work and that help. Yeah, yeah. And they, they don't have to, it's not up to anyone else, you know. And I think when you think, when you only think about the techniques and maybe even the beliefs that if you only think about the things that you could, like I say, be proud to tell somebody at a barbecue mm-hmm. that is self-limiting. Yes. You know, there might be other techniques like your car parking thing that actually, you know what, who cares what you can convince somebody of whether it's true or not, but it makes you happier. You're singing when you're driving around the car park and lo and yeah. behold, you tend to get good parts. Yeah, so why yeah. not use it? It works for you. So use it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, you know, you talk about measuring, like how do you measure love, right? How do you measure good fit? You know, the things that we value most in life can't be measured. Mm, yeah, I think just thinking, talking about what you're talking about there. Yeah, ever now, especially now, if you're a if you're an open-minded person who likes to vote, and if you can't, you know, even now the left have to measure things. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you can't, define, yeah, and that's categorize. Right. And- yeah, you know, like you can't measure love, and I think yeah. that's. That's the thing that makes us most aware and most uh, most happy, as you say, and as you're talked about in your life. I don't know, you didn't use the word love, but just manifesting happiness really for you and 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 whatnot. And, and speaking of which, you know, you're it's 2023. It's three years after the uh, 
the tsunami stopping manifestation. <laughs> 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 um, what's happening now? Where, where's your vision taking in over the next couple of years? What are you looking at? Um, well, I'm still open, you know, like to the overseas thing at the moment. You know, um, I'm doing a little live recording of that band. I'm going into a proper studio to get some band versions of um, some of the songs that I did on my Shout Into The Noise album. Um, and that album was really good. You know, we're in a playlist kind of world now um, mm. and that um, that on Spotify and all that kind of stuff, that album went way better than any album that, that right? I've, wow. I've ever had on the playlist stuff. That's and um, I'm sure... Um, a big part of that is also to do with the album before that was with Josh Teske and, you know, I I had a lot of success riding on Josh's <laughs> blessed coattails. <laughs> Thanks for the momentum, Josh. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, the, the thing with Josh put things at a certain level and I was really happy that in my own next solo album that I could still springboard off that and get a really good result. Um, yeah, so I'm quite true. hopeful. And I'm actually, to be perfectly honest, this might be sacrilegious for somebody my age, I'm not sure, but I'm enjoying actually playing that playlist game and, um, you know, like musicians look at it very differently these days in the days yeah. of playlist. And yeah. they, they're like, okay, oh, I need a song that can get on that playlist or, you know, there's a lot of that thinking that goes on. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, if people hear that, they probably think it's heresy. For me, having already done eleven studio albums, it's actually quite creative to um, yeah, to yeah. think in new ways, you know. Because we yeah. think albums have been around forever, but it, you know, some of the older songs that we listened to, they were singles, you yeah, know. So yeah. it was yeah. like playlists back then. Yeah, yeah. So Absolutely. it's you know, you know, I just think rolling with the times and not getting too dogmatic about formats and this and that. Yeah, and you've like you said, you've done eleven studio albums and and whatnot. It's time to, you know, sh- you know, go into that creatively. What's 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 his name? Who's the famous guitar playing redhead English guy that plays solo? The young guy, Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran, right? Like. I'm not listening to the radio. All of a sudden, he's got this pop song, and then he's with Beyonce, and then he's playing his heavy metal song. I'm going, this guy's living the dream. All by yeah. a single, all by a singles, right? Yeah, yeah, just being creative and just, yeah, yeah. You know, I think it can be harnessed, and I have to like, you have to change everything in how you do everything to do this. But I would love to get into a vibe where I'm like exactly like that, you know, at at my level. Um, collabing with a lot of different friends who, you know, you always think, oh, it'd be so good to do something with that guy or that guy, but, uh, you know, we won't get around to it. Just get around to it and just start being more prolific. Um, that, yeah, yeah, because you've got the technology be- right now You and you, you're amazing players. You can play the foundation, send it to them. They send something back and you ping pong before you know you've got something, right? You can, you can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's actually more the back end stuff that that lags and, and people talk about tactics and this and that. But to me, it would be more fun to just be more prolific and get stuff happening. That's you know, so that's, I might look yeah. at doing that yeah, in yeah. the in the next little while and break open that stuff and um you know, yeah, just just be doing doing more, I reckon, just more mm. making more music. Well, that's, you know, in the music world these days, especially at your level, it's like you do the album, you do the tour, you do the promo, you know, it's all supposed to be in the book, segmented, right, to do this yeah. and do that. And yeah. it's, it's, a long, it's a long way away, a lot of it, you know, from the creativity that drives us, right? Yeah, yeah, it's way down. It's 18 months after the song was written. Yeah, that, that's that right. Album. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so I yeah I love that idea, and so I, I am going to start doing more spontaneous things. And I think this this album, like tomorrow, we start rehearsals for awesome. Blues Fest, and um, then the week after, before Blues Fest, we're going to record the album. Wow, in a really good studio. So it, it's it's a bit like a band going in and doing a best of kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's oh. a, it's exciting because it's new players, my favorite band to play with in the world. So you know, my favorite two guys who are great friends and and genius players. So you know, I just don't think we can go wrong, and it it just keeps it exciting. So yeah, I just keep doing stuff. It's a mess, you know. Like you think about what the Nash grumbled when he was twelve. How old were you when you started playing guitar? 
Yeah, 10, 10 when I started. 10, look where you are now. Like, just the, forget commercial stuff or whatever. The fact you're going in a studio with dudes that you love and you record your music, man, that must be so, must be a great well, feeling. Oh, it's amazing. It really is amazing. And thank you for reminding me like that. It's always yeah. great to remember like what 10 year old or 15 year old or 25 year old you would think. Yeah, yeah. Even 35 year old me would be stoked with what I'm doing now. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, yeah. You like I now look about how my kids' milestones, you know, you go, oh, when they'll, you know, because a kid's life goes past quick for everybody, for them, for you. Yeah. And when they mention, oh, I remember the time we did this, or they go, yeah, that was a really, like, I really want to be in that, appreciate those milestones as close to the time as I can. Mm, yeah. Otherwise, otherwise yeah. it becomes nostalgia and it's lost, right? Yeah, yeah. But I so wish true. for you in two weeks' time, you're in the studio, you're going, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Universe, for rocking it. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah. I will do that. Thank you. Thanks for reminding me. I look me forward to the social media posts. Like yeah. <laughs> hey, one last thing I wanted to talk to you about was the environmental stuff. Like you've talked about, you know, some um, milestones in your life where you talked about stop drinking and you really focused on your on your career and pushing it forward. So, and where did your love or your your need to have some action on the environmental front come into your life? Um, well, you're very lucky as a musician because you get asked to do a lot. Right. So all you have to do is say yes <laughs> and do some stuff. And when the coal seam gas mining thing came, it 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 was coming closer and closer to all around the world to pe where people live. And I just I found out more about that. And as I found out more, I thought, geez, this is this is horrible. And it was coming to our area. Um, so I went up to um, Tara and uh, where they're doing it in central Queensland and talked to some residents there yeah. and stuff. And because I wanted to know, I, you know, started to help out a little bit, but I wanted to really know firsthand for myself Good. what the effects are and, you know, um, yeah, and then so I got really involved in that. And then a lot of my findings from being involved in that struggle were I put out in the album Now. It was called Now. Well, I was thinking about the Now a lot at the time. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you um, there. Yeah, um, and uh, so that really affected me and I learned a lot. And actually in, in our area, we actually managed to repel um, the gas, the coal seam gas mining companies and how they would have been storing the waste that would have all been washed away in the floods and washed yeah, in, wow. you know, so it would have been a massive, massive polluting factor. Not to mention, you know, drinking, drilling through our water aquifers and affecting our drinking water forever. Um, you for, know, it's, forever, it's forever. And and they're doing stuff like that, and the government's right into it. It's just, I just don't, I, I, I can't even start with thinking how. How, why, what, you know, why that was a good idea. How is that normal? Yeah. <laughs> so it'll be interesting, you know, with, with with so much talk of climate and whatnot, whether that coal seam gas mining thing gets really shelved. That would be really cool. But, uh, uh, you know, it's out of our area for now. And I do think on an environmental level, one thing I've learned along, along the way is... Personally, I think people should. It's great if people really um, know know about the more about the thing that they're actually supporting, and it's it's something very real world in their area um, that they can really impact. Yes, really um, for some change. Around. Well, one thing that came that I didn't even think about it. I mean, I knew it was a bad thing. I put it in the bad department, but the whole runoff, the waste thing. The waste thing yeah. you talked about, I never, I've never heard anyone talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't go. Oh, there is waste to this. I just went. I know it's bad, but yeah, they just put it in dams. Is that right? So if you're in an area that's prone to prone to flooding, that's wow. catastrophic. That's um, so yeah, I, I do what I can in my areas now, and you know, obviously we all got flooded here, so there's been a little mm -hmm. bit of stuff to do with the floods. 
Um, and I do what I can. And, I, you know, I've always felt that music is something that, you know, you, you ha- wherever you can, you should, you know, do what you can. And what are you going to do for the next couple of months? You're touring? What's going on? Well, we're um, after Blues Fest, we are going, packing up. We've got ourselves a, uh, a really nice van. I got myself some really nice debt. Uh, <laughs> I used to be really against that kind of thing, but I just, I don't know, I had some paradoxical thing that happened after all COVID and everything and worrying about things. When COVID first happened, uh, we're coming out of it in 21 and you couldn't really fly and I just got a brand new van and I drove all over the country. Fantastic. And I was touring, you know, and um, I drove. I did one gig with Josh Teske and Mackay and then drove to Fremantle. Oh, my you know, God. Stuff like that. <laughs> um, and uh, so I did that and the van was awesome and I got that taste of having a new touring van. And then I changed that for an all-wheel drive and just got myself into crazy amounts of debt, um, very irresponsibly. And uh, so if there's another lockdown, I'll just hand in the keys. I'll just like be like, okay, who wants it? That's right. I'm driving you straight to the bank. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Here it is. (laughs) Um, Yeah, but we got a really nice all-wheel drive crafter. So um, so we're going around Australia. Fantastic. Um, Yeah, and we'll take that up, you know, across to South Oz, drive down from New South Wales to South Oz, and then up to the top northwest of Australia and then right along the top to Darwin and back. Wow. That sounds amazing. Yeah. How, yeah. Long that, how long is that going to take? Well, we're doing it pretty quick because we're doing it in three months. Wow. So that's a quick time to do something like that. But and we don't fam- mind the odd 15-hour drive. Yeah, yeah. Does a family go with you or you just? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, a family yeah. thing. Oh, that's You awesome. know, because my daughter's um, 14 and, you know, uh, it's. I think it's the last chance to be, like, out of phone service, you know, out in the desert, you know. No internet. <laughs> no internet. If they get bored, all the better. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's you, the know, you know when I you got, that's that's what you hit it with. You know when I was young. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They'll be hearing a bit of that. Yeah. And you know, she's already got her friends and stuff, and she's sort of semi not looking forward to it. But um, it's bad luck um, <laughs> because this will be like some core cool mm. memory that you you know, that what you're talking about that we'll remember forever. So yeah, I think she'll it's bring, really she'll, important to do. She'll bring it up in counselling as trauma when she gets yeah, you know, she can do that. <laughs> I, um, I took my son to a tour to Melbourne. They got, it was the worst experience of our life. Where was that? <laughs> Going to Melbourne. That was it. <laughs> my two kids. It was the worst thing ever. Uh, well, that sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a little alone. It sounds like an amazing trip and... Um, I'm very jealous that you're going around there with your family. That sounds like a killer and doing gigs. And I suppose you'll be doing, have you got the surfing spots mapped out? Yeah. <laughs> Number one. There's a few good surfing spots in the, there's a few desert surf locations in Australia. Yeah. Wow. Um, there's about three that we're going to visit. Uh, they don't surf either. So wow. It's going to be hell. But <laughs> have I'll you do that. You- did you ever see the ACO, the Australian Chamber Orchestra's project, where they worked with these uh, surfers in Western Australia, like as like in the middle of you know the coast up there, is like remote? Check it out. It's a project by the ACO, and they you know it's all this classical music, but they also did like Seattle cover versions with some surfer dudes seeing it. But it's a doco about them being on the ocean and creating that project and whatnot. Yeah, did they go to King Island too? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. All I, all I remember is the West yeah, Australian yeah, no, thing no. and hanging out there yeah. and with some lads who are surfers and but I've been some nice inspiration for you. Yeah, I'll check that out. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, Ash, for chatting. It's been fantastic to meet you and hear your story. Yeah. So inspirational that you're putting yourself out there, not only musically, but, you know, with the way you want to go in life and whatnot. So I just wish you all the best and you know, may the good times and the good family you love keep going on your trip around Australia and have a great blues festival to start it all yeah, off. Yeah, thanks a lot. Well, it's been a very heartfelt um, 
conversation and uh, I really, really appreciate your uh, insights and leading me along the way. It was really awesome. Oh, thanks. I can't do it without you and your wonderful experiences. So thanks again to meeting and for chatting and uh, hopefully I'll see you around Australia one time when you're, <laughs> I'll drop yeah. in on you. You'll remember me. That'll so, be awesome. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Ash. We'll, thanks, brother. All the best, eh? Talk soon.